Hey everyone! Today we're talking about the world of illusion that's created for you. We're trying to make sense of the words, the assurances, the facts, and the truths that come to us from the highest authorities. That's right, we're looking at propaganda. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. So, what is propaganda? Well, we could start by asking Edward Bernays, the father of modern public relations. He was involved in all kinds of successful manipul uh, marketing sorry, campaigns for big business, including tricking women into thinking smoking was liberation. He also wrote a couple of books on the subject. To read just the beginning two paragraphs of his book, Propaganda, is an introduction both to what propaganda is and how propagandists think of the rest of us. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. We have to manipulate them, you see. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. In other words, even if you got rid of the people in the parliament or congress or whatever, these people would still be in charge. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested largely by men we've never heard of. This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they're to live together as a smoothly functioning society. Hmm. Really? Of course, Bernays was an elitist thinking it was a good thing that he and a few other people held the reins. Bernays worked on the Creel Committee for Public Information, the biggest PR campaign in history up to that point. The Creel Committee was the propaganda machine that sold Americans on supporting U.S. intervention in World War I. It took about six months, maybe less, to turn the pacifist, isolationist masses into salivating, war-hungry brutes. So you can learn from his books and his actions. Or Walter Lippmann, who also showed a lot of contempt for these people. Or you could read Noam Chomsky on the subject of propaganda. For instance, in the book Manufacturing Consent, where he and Edward S. Herman show you how to think critically about the news. And the more you learn about how power actually works, the easier it is to understand what propaganda is. Propaganda is all part of the exercise of power. Bernays and the rest of the technocrats he worked with and, and influenced who came after him saw most people as intellectually and morally inferior. Their published works are full of contempt for, for what they saw as the confused, sheep-like masses. I don't know what they really thought, of course, but their argument seemed to be that, that uh, people are just too ignorant to make their own decisions. That begs the question. I mean, people are ignorant, so they can't be trusted, so we have to keep them ignorant? It's not a logical proposition, but it's the attitude of propagandists and their employers in a nutshell. If we weren't indoctrinated into a world of illusion our whole lives, and instead learn to think for ourselves, we might be able to decide for ourselves. Propaganda is the words, beliefs, and assumptions the ruling class transmits to the rest of us to justify everything it does. It underpins everything we learn in school and in the mass media, and, to most of us, everything we say and believe. The term could 
perhaps be used retroactively to refer to any lies and myths perpetuated by the ruling class at any time since the dawn of states, though I'm, that might not be a very accurate use of the word. Propaganda is not what I'm doing here, either. I'm spreading a perspective, true, but usually when we talk about propaganda, we mean not just any ideology, but the dominant one. Not the possible, but the normal. All rulers of hierarchical societies had ideological bases for their rule, excuses, if you will, and that became the truth. In some times and places, it was normal, obvious, unquestioned, that we should kill girls to make the gods happy, to make the crops grow. Today, it's normal and unquestioned to think letting a few, pe few really rich people make all the most important decisions and impose them on the rest of us is the ideal way to organize society. I think of propaganda as a scripted reality that surrounds us and penetrates our thoughts. Plato described it using the allegory of the cave, although I don't think he was talking about propaganda exactly. A more updated metaphor that we could use for our purposes might be to imagine propaganda as a jail cell. And you're there for life, unless you can find a way to escape. But unlike a normal jail cell, you were born into this one. So you don't even realize it's a cell. Because you have no other sense of reality to base your thinking on, you accept whatever the prison guards tell you about yourself, about themselves, and what they're supposed to do, the nature of the prison, and the state of the world outside the prison. You can live there quite comfortably as long as you don't look at the bars. You might even train yourself never to look at the bars, to respect and appreciate your jailers for all the food they bring you, and get angry at anyone who suggests escaping. That's your brain protecting itself from uncomfortable new ideas. So propaganda is not necessarily about lies. Politicians lie, but often that's just to cover themselves and create their personal image. But the things they say don't deviate from the propaganda, the grand illusion of the normal. No politician who hopes to last long would suggest questioning the whole system, or even just questioning the existence of one unpopular agency, like ICE or the NSA. The state has to justify everything it does, and will claim those agencies are necessary and impossible to abolish. Or they'll, they'll make some huge gesture by abolishing it, but just giving all the powers to other agencies. Then you've got news media. News media lie, sure, but not that much. Their lies aren't the most dangerous thing they do. What the news media do is they pose as watchdogs, informing us of what's important when what they really do is just add to the grand illusion. They tell us what we should think is important, and then they make us think we chose our own values. I mean, if they wanted to tell us what was important, journalists would be investigating the deals that are being brokered at the highest levels among rich people. They'd be telling us about the closed-door meetings between government and the wealthy. Instead, the news tells us a few things that are happening and how we're supposed to feel about them, followed by sports, weather, the internal drama of the British royal family, celebrity gossip, and Donald Trump's Twitter account. And they're punctuated by messages from corporate sponsors. And those commercials, by the way, are also integral to forming our beliefs of the normal. There are some questions you can, you can always ask if you really do want to watch the news or read the newspaper. 
How do they decide which news events to cover? There are millions of things going on in the world. Why is this medium telling me about this event? What are they not telling us about this event? What else is going on in the world that might be more important? Because what the news media talk about is what informed people think is important. And certainly propaganda can be directed toward the supposed foreign enemy, but the real enemy, the real threat to their rule, is their local domestic population. If those people stop buying into the propaganda, the illusion crumbles, and with it the power of the people on top. Because we're allowed some freedom of thought, there are also so-called alternative media you can learn from. They often talk about topics the mainstream media won't cover, or the same topics from a different angle. But they aren't necessarily more true or less biased. So just like everything else, just like everything I say, you can think critically about them. Where do they get their funding? What are their biases? What are they not saying and why? When we learn how propaganda works, we can come to see media words like democracy and freedom as hollow. Why do we need to be told all the time, this is what it means to be free? This is what democracy looks like. This is what a worthy victim looks like. And that's what an evil dictator looks like. I think we should also bear in mind that books are not necessarily more authoritative or unbiased than news media. When you read a history book, it helps, again, to ask yourself some questions, like, what are this person's biases? What might they want to leave out as not conforming to their beliefs or the theory that they're putting forward in this book? And it's all books. All subjects, all facts, are based on the assumptions of their time and place. Propaganda comes from the highest authorities, and the best publishers, after all. I studied things like political science, economics, history, and there's a lot of consensus among social science scientists about things that are actually highly debatable. In fact, think about why we even call them social sciences and political science. Universities adopted those terms to sound authoritative. They've turned hypotheses into widespread beliefs. It's bad enough we believe the so-called hard sciences can be value-free. They can't, but, but I don't know enough about them, so I'm not going to talk about them. <laughs> but some of us are, are led to believe even the social sciences are based on fact, as opposed to guesswork and ideology. So that's convenient for us. Because then we've got these facts, or ideological beliefs masquerading as facts, and we base our worldviews on them, and we spread them to others. Where we learned them gets forgotten. They're facts, after all. Doesn't matter. Propaganda is about painting a full picture of the world the people in power want you to believe in, and... Equally importantly, inducing you to take action. If propaganda works as it's supposed to, people will do exactly what the ruling class wants them to do, and they'll think it was their own idea. In that sense, propaganda creates a kind of invisible ideology. After all, it's based on a set of beliefs, and highly questionable ones at that, I talk about those beliefs in all my videos, so I won't go uh, into detail, into specifics about them here. But unlike something you can learn about and choose to adopt, we're talking about an ideology portraying itself as reality. It's not surprising to hear people say that they're opposed to ideology or immune to advertising or something. 
a lot of those people don't realize their minds already belong to an ideology that they can't see. As one of the main purposes of propaganda is to legitimize the system and normalize its operations, it tells us to feel good about working for that system. Deep down, people might feel anything, but they always have propaganda as an excuse. I'm doing this for my country, for example. Just like during the Crusades, they said they were doing it for God. And it's not much different, since people will sign up to kill people on the other side of the world for my country, or, or for my God, or for freedom, whatever they have to tell themselves to sleep at night. Same with people who apply for spy agencies or administrative support roles in the military, who are just as much a part of the war machine as the people pulling the triggers. They know that. They have to sleep at night, too. Our cultural assumptions appear as universal truths when nearly everyone you know takes them for granted. So they accept the excuses that these wars are to stop terrorism and spread freedom. No questioning, no reason to question, because it's normal. As such, the hardest people to reach, the people least likely to want to listen to a new perspective, to question and to change, are the people who most rely on the system. So rich people or people who believe they might be rich one day, <laughs> good luck, people who work for the state or who have a chosen political party that they, they labor under, anyone whose salary or worldview depends on maintaining the illusion. That's a lot of people. But most people are ultimately capable of understanding things differently and questioning what they've been told. That's what the fight scene in the movie They Live is all about. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of time, that's a long scene, to get someone to see things differently. I won't get into school today because I've made a whole series on school you can check out. You could say our indoctrination begins in school, and you'd be close to correct. Because that's where we're trained to obey authority and accept its version of the world. But actually, our indoctrination starts as soon as we start learning about the world around us. Our parents and families teach us normal. They learned normal and then passed it on to us. In that way, the system sustains and recreates itself. Propaganda makes us all carriers of the same virus. So not all propaganda comes from official sources. In fact, being the skeptics we believe we are, if something comes from official sources like the state or the church, we take it with a grain of salt. That's why we have such a big anti-vax movement going on right now. Experts and the state want you to vaccinate, so being such skeptics, we're going to say, we're not going to vaccinate. Try being a little more skeptical, if that's your position. But when everyone uses the same words with the same assumptions behind them, like calling a very unequal society a democracy, or saying the police serve and protect the people, they're creating the normal. People seem to think propaganda only comes from sources they dislike. Republicans call CNN and universities the, the sources of propaganda. Democrats blame Fox News and evangelical churches. They don't get that it's all those institutions and more. All hierarchical social institutions communicate propaganda. It's presented as truth in institutions of learning. It's presented as fact in the news. It's in the words of politicians and business spokespeople and diplomats and professors and military recruiters and so on. Everyone in authority takes part in the charade. 
They need to conform to the propaganda in word and deed, whether or not they see through it. They're not trying to convince you. They're just adding to the tapestry of how you're supposed to see the world, putting up posters in your jail cell for you. The existence of propaganda is the reason we don't need far-out speculation about the purposes of fluoride in the drinking water, or if there are subliminal messages, or the purposes of chemtrails to brainwash us, or some other kind of government mind control. The fact is, we're susceptible to the everyday mind control of propaganda, especially domesticated humans like us. It's not a bunch of conspiracies that you need to debunk. It's one conspiracy that we're all in on. It's everyone who talks about politics, the news, facts, statistics, history, or any other representation of reality without acknowledging that it's all based on illusion, or on a shared hallucination, as Howard Bloom said. Hierarch hierarchical society requires violence to, to maintain itself, and the more inequality there is, the more violence there's going to be. But it also requires propaganda, because even the threat of extreme violence is not necessarily enough to stop a popular uprising. But if you can convince enough of your population, elite rule and inequality and war and prison are justified, your revolution is a lot harder to carry out. Each hierarchical society has used propaganda to divide people into classes. It's part of divide and conquer. Propaganda always accompanies policy, or maybe even precedes it, so that people even demand a policy that's against their interest because they've been induced, they've been tricked. For example, a united working class could form a, a powerful political movement that would shake up the status quo. So the propaganda keeps people divided by race and class. Europeans enslaved millions of Africans because they considered them inferior because it was in their financial interest to believe the propaganda. But even poor whites bought into it. And I'll tell you why because it's easier to choose to believe and side with the powerful in return for some meager privileges like a dog begging for scraps than it is to do the right thing. Sometimes race is even more arbitrary than skin color. Belgian colonial rule divided Rwandans into two nearly indistinguishable groups who would end up killing each other for decades so that they wouldn't unite to kill their oppressors. And it culminated in genocide in 1994. But since then, the people have discarded their inherited racial labels. They're just Rwandans now. Unity is strength. So until people wake up to the fact that their minds have been colonized, they'll continue to be divided by whatever artificial lines. Whoever the ruling class wants to use violence against, that's the other. I mentioned last week the need for an enemy. If the people have an enemy, they aren't looking at how the powerful are screwing them over every day. They're scapegoating minorities or supporting wars. Fear and hate is essential to propaganda. It divides us into in-groups and out-groups. It leads to all kinds of violence. And it's usually just a way of distracting people from the activities of the rich assholes who are picking their pockets. In the book How Propaganda Works, Jason Stanley writes, In a society that's unjust, due to unjust distinctions between persons, ways of rationalizing undeserved privilege become ossified into rigid and unchangeable belief. 
These beliefs are the barriers to rational thought and empathy that propaganda exploits. Modern states have an interest in fostering nationalism because it tends to mean fiercely supporting the state. That's why so many people from so many countries have told me they want a strong state or a strong president when that necessarily means less power for the people they rule. They make you think you've got the power because as they always tell you, you are the government. So if you so if the state is strong, that must mean you're strong too. But really the opposite is true. So one thing propaganda does is push for unity behind the elite among the in-group. And part of that is about creating an out-group, an enemy. The need for conformity extends to hating the enemy. If you don't hate the enemy, you are the enemy. When I lived in China, I noticed they sold old Cultural Revolution posters in the street, and I found them fascinating. I, I wrote about it on my old blog, actually, while I was still there. Let's, uh, let's take a look at some of them. Here's your first one. It says, destroy the old world, forge a new world. I think that was kind of the essence of most of these posters. It was about moving from the old, which is bad, to the new, which is the future. And you can see this uh, kind of idealized uh, worker here, or, or soldier, or something, you know, but clearly Red Guard. And he's smashing up all the symbols of the old, including uh, religious statues and so on. And this is, I, I put in some old photos as well to show uh, that these things were often based on reality. Proletarian revolutionaries and rebels unite! And it couldn't be more obvious that you've got to unite under the book, under Mao's book that's being held up. They're united under Mao and under this book. Makes sense, right? Same with this one. They're under and following the book. There's a lot of these posters where it, it almost looks like the book itself is leading the way. It's how they wanted that book to be the Bible of its time and place, to be studied, followed, honored, but never questioned, just like the guy who wrote it. One important point in the book Propaganda by Jacques Ellul is propaganda is not just about beliefs, but it's designed to compel action. And you can see that in some of these posters. Um, yeah, again, they're following the book. China itself is following the book. Children have long been the propaganda tools of people like Mao and Stalin, and Hitler, and all those guys, all the really good propagandists. Uh, this is also for kids. It basically just says, study really hard. But really, what are they studying? They're holding red books. Uh, is that the only thing they needed to study? Well, kind of, as you can see here, or here. Uh, this poster says that if, if you join the People's Liberation Army, you're basically engaging in um, Mao Zedong thought. That that's what you're, you know, that's what you're supposed to do. Of course you should join the army. <clears throat> Here are the various armed forces. It says the People's Military is invincible. Stand your ground. Uh, still more militarism, basically. Resolutely annihilate all enemies who dare invade our country. And, of course, you know, it's 
legitimate in the sense that there was a fear that they might be invaded by the, the capitalists, the imperialist powers. So it makes sense. It's just an interesting pra uh, uh, practice in propaganda to me. The great proletarian revolution unites workers, farmers, and soldiers, and will for sure liberate Taiwan. <laughs> Um, unity of the diverse people of China is a common theme in these posters. That really makes sense because China has always been an empire with restive native populations in its various corners. Pushing unity has always been an important aspect of Han nationalism. Then you've got this poster. I, I, I kind of like it. Um, this is at Beijing University, I guess in the 70s during the Cultural Revolution. The animosity displayed during the Cultural Revolution wasn't only directed at internal bourgeois enemies, but also at external ones. Um, I saw a poster reading, it wasn't actually this one, it was a different one. It says, destroy the Soviet Union. Um, the one I saw actually read, destroy or maybe smash the Soviet Union on the left, and destroy imperialist America on the right. I find that an interesting tale of nationalism and enemies. Um, for a while, America, or the U.S., was the enemy, then it was the U.S. and the USSR, which actually in this poster is, uh, is sort of called the revisionist Soviet Union, rather than the the, the word they used to use before that for the Soviet Union. They, it changed to like the revisionist union, basically. Um, but now, today, Chinese nationalism depends on Japan as the enemy. And that's because our enemies are whomever we're told to hate for whatever reasons. And once people acquire ideas like nationalism, they become truth. And they don't need propaganda to spread anymore. Though propaganda is always there helping them along. You don't need a law telling everyone to stand up for the national anthem if your parents are going to make you do it. You don't need a law banning flag burning when it's considered virtuous to beat up people who burn flags. You may have heard me make references to the book 1984 on this channel. It's my favorite book, so I'll do it a lot. Oceania represents the perfect indoctrinated society, where even thinking something unorthodox makes you a criminal. Like all good science fiction, 1984 is only an extrapolation. Uh, what could happen if things keep going in a certain direction? We're only slightly less indoctrinated than they are. Have you ever tried to disabuse someone of something they've believed in for a long time? Did you maybe feel like they were going to brand you a thought criminal? People get angry when you destroy their illusions. Even if they're illusions handed to them by someone else that don't benefit them. But then we're not living in 1984. Maybe they'll just ignore you. Oh, you're just a kooky conspiracy theorist. I don't know where you picked up these strange ideas, but they're different from what I've been told all my life, so they must be wrong. Either way, people defend the system and fight for myths and think they're acting of their own accord. That's the power of propaganda. Jacques Ellul emphasizes that propaganda must be total, surrounding us, with no gaps to make, uh, to make, to, to let you make your own beliefs about something. That's why, as I said, propaganda is not so much about lies. It's a whole system of beliefs that may or may not have anything to do with reality. They're kept alive by the conscious effort of PR people and their bosses, and the unconscious learning and transmitting the rest of us do. Hardly anyone deviates from the narrow spectrum of acceptable beliefs, certainly not on the news. 
So no one even considers things could be different. Donald Trump assassinates a foreign general. The news talks about the strategic value of such a strike, rather than more fundamental questions about whether anybody should have the, that power in the first place. We talk about the desirability of being ruled by one or another politician instead of asking why we're ruled by other people at all. We talk about getting jobs instead of the fact that we're forced to give up most of our time and freedom to make rich people richer. Indoctrinated people always stay within those acceptable limits. They might entertain other ideas, but dismiss them as unfeasible. Doesn't fit in with the way the world is at the moment. Couldn't work. In fact, I can often get people to agree with me about freedom, justice, and even the, the need for a revolution. But they'll still avoid talking or thinking about it in favor of endless discussion of pointless elections and issues they have no influence on. It's called cognitive dissonance. When you have conflicting beliefs, it's painful, especially when beliefs that you base your identity on, like nationalism, are threatened. As a result, we often reject the new, less comfortable information to ease the pain. But that's only if we notice the beliefs conflict. Some people can live their whole lives believing Americans only want peace and freedom for everyone, even though the state is constantly at war must be a war for peace. We're the good guys. Because modern systems of power center on the nation-state, so does propaganda. For one thing, the actions of the state are far more widely considered legitimate than the same actions taken by civilians. If I killed even just one person, I'd be vilified. Soldiers and cops do it all the time and get a paycheck for it. If I put people in a cage and don't let them out, no matter what those people did, I'd be a kidnapper. The state puts millions of people behind bars on whatever pretext and gets praise for being tough on crime. Another aspect of modern propaganda is we're not expected to distinguish between a country and all aspects of a country. So when we talk about the actions of governments or anyone by referring to the country, it sounds strange to me. We'll say the U.S. invaded Iraq. Of course, words are useful for simplifying ideas, sure, but we need to bear in mind there's a huge difference between the U.S. military and the people, land, culture, and history of this huge landmass. That distinction might seem obvious to you, but most people never question it. They say things like, well, that whole region had it coming. Or, they send terrorists after us, and we retaliate. Propaganda has us writing off huge parts of the world and thinking we don't need to know any history about it because we heard about a couple of people from there who did something we didn't like. For most people, a few images is all they need to make decisions about whether they like and trust broad, poorly defined categories of people, or whether those are going to be unworthy victims. Look at all this the violence this collapsing of nuance leads to, as millions of Muslims have been targeted around the world legitimizes war and racist violence. And why? Because the people in power had an interest in stirring up fear of terrorism and hate against Muslims, and millions of civilians sleepwalking through life were easy to manipulate. They were told to want revenge for 9-11, and they complied. Some of them still do. They so blindly wanted revenge. Some people signed up to kill people in Iraq because of 9-11. Why? 
There was no connection. Everyone who understood the situation, even a little, knew there was no connection. But indoctrinated people don't care about facts. They believe whatever they're told to believe and grasp at anything that reinforces their beliefs. The groundwork for tricking people into supporting war after 9-11, of course, had been laid decades earlier, in school and in the media. One thing they learned was, our country is a force for good in the world. They'd been taught history from a very limited perspective, like everyone in every country, and picked up all kinds of myths about how the economy and the political system worked, and what great people they are. Remember Elul, propaganda is about inducing people to take action. Once people have been thoroughly encircled by propaganda, it only takes a few tugs of the strings to move them to action. In the case of 9-11, they saw images of an attack on people they didn't even know by apparently foreign forces. Ipso facto, they would have to go to war. So propaganda is very much a matter of life and death. Most people's minds belong to the propagandists, the PR people of the world. But you can save yours by learning to question things. You can save others by helping them see the jail cell for what it is. The truth is out there, but it won't be televised. Thanks everyone who actually got all the way to the end. Please like and comment and share and subscribe and so on. See you next week.